we are looking forward to our keynote speaker, Melanie Riebach. She will be talking to us about how business models and security can conflict sometimes. Welcome, Melanie. So, freemium. This is a word that strikes fear in the hearts of everyone in this room, I'm sure. Am I wrong? No? <laughs> All right. So, uh, freemium creates a whole lot of problems in open source in general. I'm sure you know the dilemma. You found this open source package that you absolutely love. Then they get a venture capitalist. Then suddenly, slowly, uh, things start migrating a bit away from free. It starts with uh, maybe you know, needing a subscription for the, you know, just the SAML integration, right? <laughs> you know, and then slowly before you know it, if you want to use, uh, you know, some significant subset of the product, now suddenly it requires per seat enterprise licenses that uh, basically make usage of the software package prohibitive. Now, it, this is not just a problem for the software itself. But this is also a problem for security as well. Before I explain why, I'm just going to give you a bit of introduction about who I am, <laughs> so you can understand also why I've been invited uh, and why I'm here to tell you this story. So my name is Melanie Ryback, and I am the CEO and co-founder of Radically Open Security. So Radically Open Security is a 10-year-old social enterprise in the cybersecurity space. We uh, mostly do pen testing and security audits, uh, but we do a number of other things that are security related. Uh, we have this words, these words radically open uh, in our, uh, <laughs> in our uh, name. That's, there's a good reason for that. Uh, one reason, firstly, is that uh, we only use open source, <laughs> basically, and um, in part because we have something called the peek over our shoulder model of work, uh, workflow of pen testing, where we invite customers into our chat rooms so they can watch us work. And then uh, by using open source, I can thus ensure that my customers can actually freely make use of whatever tools we're using during the audits. Now, uh, another thing that's notable also about Radically Open Security is that we're a not-for-profit. What does that mean? <laughs> so first of all, uh, we are owned by a foundation. So nine years, uh, nine years ago, I basically gave the company away for one euro to a foundation. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, the steward ownership movement, uh, but we're structured as steward owned. The second thing also is we donate 90% of our profits to charity. So I don't know if you are familiar with the Dutch uh, NLNet Foundation. Uh, NLNet, uh, well, basically we give 90% of our profits to them. The last 10% is our cash flow buffer. We need to make payroll every month. Uh, mind you, this is 90% of our profits, not 90% of our revenue. And NLNet then redistributes this money to open source projects, digital rights initiatives, and anything for a better open internet. We just closed our 2023 book year, and we're about to make another donation to NLNet uh, of roughly 200,000 euros uh, for last year, thus bringing our total donation to NLNet so far up to 1 million euros. So, <laughs> thank you. So, uh, so basically, I set my company up in such a way <laughs> uh, as a financially non-extractive uh, social enterprise that only donates money to charity. Why? Because, quite frankly, I found most of the companies in the cybersecurity industry too commercial. So uh, the reason why I'm giving you this, uh, this background is so you can understand also ideologically where I'm coming, coming from. <laughs> uh, I'd originally started Radically Open Security uh, when I had noticed a backlash in the Dutch uh, cybersecurity scene. So I'm based in Amsterdam, and I don't know if you can recall roughly 10, 11 years ago, uh, we had, uh, once every four years, we have this homegrown hackers camp uh, that's called, uh, well, last time it was uh, MCH, but you know, then before that we had SHA, before we had that we had OM. 
right? <laughs> Observe, hack, make. Now, what had happened was uh, both the, the, the German Chaos Computer Club as well as the Dutch hacker scene had boycotted OM because a certain commercial cybersecurity company, I don't feel like naming, was the chief sponsor. <laughs> uh, and uh, a lot of people had ethical problems with this company because they were doing things like building surveillance systems, selling them to developing countries. And when we asked them to stop, did they stop? No, they just sold that part of the company. <laughs> you know, the cybersecurity field is also involved in hacking activists, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, because Extinction Rebellion is so frightening. <laughs> uh, and just in general, if there aren't ethical problems, there are, uh, there, you, you've got the big accountancy firms that are so, how do I say, so opaque and not wanting to share their knowledge that it also isn't optimally helping. Now, at the time, uh, not only was there the boycott, but also with an observe, hack, make, uh, there was kind of a camp within a camp called Noisy Square that was just dedicated to the top discussion of ethics in cybersecurity. This was the context in which I started my company. So after uh, I started life as an academic, as a as an assistant professor of computer science at the Free University of a Amsterdam in the group of Andrew Tannenbaum, um, I also, uh, at a certain point, moved over to industry. I worked for Citrix in the Zen Hypervisor team, and then I moved to the cybercrime team at ING Bank. And I also quickly realized, also, from the point of view of the customer, that uh, a lot of cybersecurity consultancies are keeping their customers in the dark. My exact experience was, uh, it was 2004, and we were under attack. So there was a distributed denial of service attack on ING Bank. Our servers were offline. Uh, we were in the news, like literally there were little like political cartoons of the ING lion getting, you know, uh, how do I say, like attacked by rockets, you know. <laughs> the, uh, the sea levels are in the war room. And of course, what happens? The network engineers pick up the phone and then they call the Rabobank, <laughs> their competitor. And then they started exchanging uh, firewall rules. Now, this isn't so surprising if you think about it. Because in cybersecurity, your company has no competitors. We're used to thinking that we need to keep you know, everything secret and know we shouldn't be sharing you know, with our competitors. But actually, the way that cybercrime works <laughs> is that uh, the criminals work in organized campaigns. Right? They're going to be uh, attacking uh, ING one day, Abian Amro another day, Rabobank the other day, and then probably uh, you know, some uh, Deutsche Bank uh, you know, the, the, the week after. It's just quite simply because it's easy, right? <laughs> you know, and they have business models, and their business models is getting as much low-hanging fruit as possible <laughs> without having to change their tools and techniques more than necessary. Which basically means that just like in the open source community, also in the cybersecurity community, sharing is caring. <laughs> because actually, the real enemy in all of this is the cyber criminals. It's not the defenders, right? And I would say that uh, the Netherlands has actually been one of the leaders in this. The Dutch National Cybersecurity Center uh, facilitated also for the last you know, decades uh, these industry vertical groups called ISACs, where they basically uh, divided them up into, for example, telco, uh, defense, banking, uh, you know. And, and the idea is competitors across the industry get together, I mean, of course, they have to sign necessary NDAs, <laughs> but then they share threat information, uh, which then al allows all of them to become stronger. This sounds like a really obvious thing to do, but uh, you would be surprised at how non-obvious this is for quite a number of countries. For example, one time I had given a CSERT training in uh, Ecuador in Latin America, and uh, one of the men told me there that, you know, it sounds great what you're doing in the Netherlands, but, you know, we could never do this. And I was like, well, why? <laughs> and he said, well, you have to understand it's the culture here. We've got this macho thing going on. You think I'm going to tell my competitor that I got hacked? <laughs> 
So, you know, it really is, and it's not just Latin America, but it's also throughout the European Union. Uh, ENISA actually has some very interesting published studies, country by country, about things like coordinated vulnerability disclosure. And you would be shocked by the number of countries that do not have this in order yet. I'm not sure the exact status uh, of Germany, but what I can say is the first uh, European countries really who did organize this well were uh, the Netherlands, France, Belgium, and uh, Lithuania. <laughs> uh, there's another 10 countries, I believe, including Germany, uh, that are you know, also busy after that in the second, next wave of arranging these things. And then there's another tranche of, uh, of countries that are just not even touching this at all, because it's still too contentious. So, um, but the problem here is that uh, companies sometimes have tools where they're able to help. I mean, take antivirus. <laughs> With uh, antivirus, uh, as many of you know, it's essentially pattern matching, right? Signature-based uh, pattern matching. Now, what this means is that an AV engine by itself is worthless, right? Because what's a pattern matching engine without something to match to? Really, of course, the, uh, the, the key to all of this is the stream of signatures. But there's only one problem. With most AV engines, you need to pay for the stream of signatures, which is kind of like saying, well, I know you guys are sick, and I've got the medicine here, and I'm only going to give it to you if you pay, it, pay me. So, you know, not a very helpful <laughs> uh, business model, right? Um, the problem here with this is that, you know, if it's not signature-based uh, subscriptions, you know, on the, uh, oh, I'm sorry, if it's not uh, subscriptions on the signatures, the other way of doing it would be a bit more like, uh, for example, Avast, where they, okay, you can have the signatures for free, but we're going to collect your data. And I'm not entirely sure that a surveillance capitalism uh, <laughs> model uh, is, is, is that much better. Now, it shouldn't take that great of a leap of imagination to understand that you can apply open source business models to all of this. And for those who are not familiar with the open source business model, it's as follows. You give away the product, you sell services. Now, this is a perfectly viable uh, business model. I mean, there, if you look in the DevOps industry, granted, it's given, gone a bit more freemium than I like, but <laughs> you can see that there's quite a few you know, unicorns anyway that have come up uh, via uh, giving away products, selling services, and basically doing conference ev evangelism. <laughs> you know it works, <laughs> right? So, um, but uh, the problem here is you know, that in cybersecurity, it, it somehow it seems like my field is really lagging a bit behind. Because what happens is uh, we have all of these VC-funded startups. Now, in again, I'm from Amsterdam. In the Netherlands, we have these startup incubators for cybersecurity. Uh, the largest, most prominent one is called the Hague Security Delta. Now, the whole point of the Hague Security Delta is that it, uh, well, cultivates, you know, small, uh, you know, founders of cybersecurity companies, oftentimes academics who are looking to valorize uh, state-funded research. And then they immediately get paired up with a venture capitalist. Now, once this happens, now the problem is, well, actually, I'm not sure this is a problem. I can say as the founder and CEO of a cybersecurity company that it is extremely easy to be successful in the cybersecurity industry, at least if you have a bit of background. I'll tell you why, it's a hot industry. And the thing is, the, the, the typical model is that uh, you start the company, you get the VC, you grow exponentially for you know, four or five years, and then somebody buys you, you know, preferably one of the big tech companies out of, from Silicon Valley, right? <laughs> now, the, the thing is, there is a talent shortage in cybersecurity, particularly with if you have good ethical hackers. Now, uh, <laughs> we are attractive aqua hires 
It's what it is. <laughs> you know, it's really hard to hire good cybersecurity staff, so why would you bother with all the recruiting if you can just purchase a company? So there's actually a really easy exit strategy for all of these cybersecurity companies. But the problem is, though, once they get acquired, it is extremely destructive for the company. Because if we are aqua hires, what this means is they're just buying us because they want the staff. What about the product or service that we spent so much time innovating? Half the time, it just gets discarded. And then think about the amount of wasted time, energy, money, <laughs> oftentimes also uh, subsidies that had funded the academics who you know, had their original cybersecurity research that they'd wanted to valorize in the, in the first place. I mean, this is sheer value destruction just for the sake of financial capital. Sure, you know, some of the founders and uh, shareholders might get rich off of it, but in a way, it's almost like the company never existed. You know, this doesn't help. The other thing also is that uh, with the VCs, some are more open-minded than others, but the vast majority of them do not understand open source, which basically means we immediately get pushed towards creating a proprietary black box. If you go to any uh, sort of commercial cybersecurity conferences, the really big obvious one that comes to mind is a conference like RSA in San Francisco. If you walk around the trade show, you will see a vast sea of proprietary black boxes <laughs> um, you know, with, with a very small handful of exceptions. And it's quite simply because it is the business model that the VCs understand, right? And yet, in cybersecurity, again, sharing is caring. And security is a mindset. Security is a process, a long-term process. It's not just you know, a, <laughs> a set of boxes you can just toss in your network and, 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 and not understand. So the point here is that uh, what we need is not tens of thousands of proprietary small black boxes, but we actually need a smaller amount of essentially crowdfunded via customer revenue open source white boxes. The other problem also with these black boxes is vendor lock-in. So I can also give you uh, another example. At one point in time, back when I was at ING Bank, we had bought a uh, monitoring box. Uh, at that point, uh, we were like, great, you know, we, we'd like to use this box. We went back to the company and we were like, hey, can you, you know, give us the password so we can log into this thing? They were like, sorry, we can't give it to you because it's all proprietary tools, at which point we were like, well, what the F did we just buy? <laughs> So, um, but the point is that uh, if you think about the really large projects that move the needle, it tends to be initiatives that are run also by not-for-profits. Consider things like uh, MISP, uh, the threat intel sharing platform. It is run by the uh, by CERT Lou, the, the, the National C CERT team of Luxembourg. You also have uh, companies like, uh, well, not companies, but organizations like uh, Shadow Server uh, that go also, you know, collecting threat intel and then also notifying uh, organizations if they've been compromised or if they have bots and, and they need, need to clean it up, uh, these kinds of things. All of these kinds of initiatives are not for profit. So why then are we mostly delegating <laughs> the job of keeping a society secure <laughs> uh, to for-profit commercial companies. Now, it turns out, actually, that there is an alternative. Now, the first alternative, I don't know if you're familiar already with the business model, it's something called steward ownership. I'll be happy to uh, inform you that uh, it 
started pretty much here in Germany. <laughs> So uh, the, the, the Purpose Foundation, uh, you know, the original TED Talk by, uh, I'm going to pronounce this wrong, Armin Stuernagel, I think he's, uh, is his name. Uh, he, uh, I believe he's even located here in Berlin. Um, you know, I mean, the concept of uh, a foundation-owned not-for-profit company has been around for longer. Of course, uh, Denmark and Scandinavia has a very long history of foundation-owned companies. But foundation ownership isn't enough, as you uh, can see with OpenAI, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, it seemed like, uh, you know, foundation ownership was a great idea for OpenAI until they decided to create a commercial subsidiary and then uh, sell it for, you know, equity for $12 billion to Microsoft. And thus, everything goes off the rails. This is why you need something extra. And that something extra is called a golden share. So what a golden share is, is it is like a veto vote that prevents you from selling the company. Mind you, this is the point in time where every VC's head is going to pop, right? <laughs> like, what? A company that you're not supposed to sell? <laughs> well, what's the point then, right? <laughs> well, maybe the point is actually to serve society with whatever product or service that we're creating that someone values enough to want to pay for it, <laughs> right? And, and this starts to bring in uh, things like systems thinking, Right? If you want to actually really meaningfully reform the system, you need to reform the financial incentives. You can sit there mopping up symptoms. And this was one of the frustrations I had working in cybersecurity for so many years. I spent my whole career, both as an academic and as well as when I was in industry, creating what felt like technological band-aids. <laughs> you know, I created all kinds of privacy enhancing technologies. We made a, pro a project, for example, called the NetAid Kit, which was a uh, Wi Fi tour, an open VPN router for journalists and activists, open source, great project. But do we really need tech band aids to solve us, you know, to, to fix business model problems? At the end of the day, our technology band-aids are not going to save us from Facebook, from Google, from Amazon. And I realized at a certain point that we actually need to fight business models with business models. This brings up uh, related topics of things like the digital commons, <laughs> uh, which uh, I, I would say is the next frontier in open source. If you want to build so software that is going to be free and be able to stay free, <laughs> then it means you also need to give it this complementary, uh, less, well, basically not financially non-extractive business model. Otherwise, you are destined to go the freemium route. It does mean, however, that uh, you, well, need to be willing to perhaps uh, personally give up the, the opportunity <laughs> to be able to cash out. And the, 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 the honest truth is not everyone wants this. See, with radically open security, so I gave it away 10 years ago, uh, I can't undo it now. But it's also true that radically open security is the only Dutch cybersecurity of our age and our size, we've got 50 people in the company, that has not been sold. The only one. <laughs> uh, you know, other market leaders, I mean, have been sold one, if not multiple times, eventually leading back to, you know, I think one big company now, it started as an open source shop, then it sort of became commercial, then it began, per was purchased by an offshore company. Like, what does offshore have to do with? cyber anyway but <laughs> but this is the point that I'm making at a certain point it might as well just go to private equity you see this problem also uh, outside of the IT field if you consider what happened to the body shop <laughs> I mean eventually uh, you know it started as a uh, as a social enterprise then you know it got purchased by uh, someone who was still in the health and wellness field and then it got sold to private equity you know and this is the way that all of this stuff is going and the problem is that those of us in the open source ecosystem, if we, well, first of all, most of us don't even want to start a company because business is evil, 
right? <laughs> uh, but uh, the problem, though, is that then we will be tempted to do things like get grants and subsidies, for example, from an NLNet, <laughs> you know, or from the European Commission, or, I don't know, German Science Foundation, or, or whoever. And it's all well and good, but then the problem is that we will work on our hobby project until the money runs out. Once the money runs out, then we basically start asking the question, gee, I wonder if somebody wants to buy this? And then we hear crickets chirping. And thus is the death of like 90% of open source projects. Because most of us just don't want to think about a business model. And trust me, I get it. <laughs> but the thing though is that A, uh, if, if you get rid of the financial extractiveness out of commercial business models, then all that's left is finding users and, and actually building something of enough value and interest that the users are also willing to pay something for it. But if you can just make sure via strong asset locks that nobody is going to be compensated more than middle class salaries and a pension, it means everything that you bring in is reinvested into growth and stability of the business, which means your open source project is most likely to survive. Because most of the large open source projects, the ones that do succeed, eventually seem to have a business behind it, whether we like it or not. But most of the time, it is commercial business. And this is, I think, the big disruptive thing where we can basically start uh, making the difference. If we start coupling it with steward-owned and financially non-extractive business rather than commercial business. But this also requires different kinds of uh, incubators that are available. You know, that can take essentially open source project founders, reluctant entrepreneurs, I say reluctant because most of you, you know, don't want to be part of the capitalist system, but still be able to teach you the tools to be able to build a long-term financially viable business. You know, and the other thing also that I, I noticed is a problem with the cybersecurity industry is that uh, the market leaders in this space also most of the time are bleeding cash like there's no tomorrow. You know? And this leads to very strange behavior. Take a company like Palantir. <laughs> I mean, beyond the uh, very obvious uh, ethical implications behind some of the things that they're working on, it might surprise you to, to know that they have bled you know, hundreds of millions in capital, and yet they still survive. If you also look at uh, some of the uh, large uh, monitoring appliances, you know, the ones with the really, really big stands, you know, at, uh, uh, at, uh, at the RSA, right? Take some of the market leaders like, uh, I don't know, for example, Palo Alto Networks. They have never earned a cent of profit in their entire existence. And you might start to wonder, how can that be? How can you actually become a market leader and yet bleed money at the same time. And this is when things really start getting weird. <laughs> now, uh, basically what it is, is that these companies, they survive. Their chief business model is not selling the product or service that they are purporting <laughs> uh, to be focused around, but actually their chief business model is selling equity. And people buy this equity just because they want to speculate on it. It's basically one really large fin financial casino. So actually, in reality, these companies are not even cybersecurity companies at all. They're financial institutions. You know? So uh, the problem here with this is it becomes a whole distraction <laughs> from the actual business of cybersecurity. You know? Also, uh, because you know, when you're financially speculating on markets, narrative matters a whole lot. And this is part of the reason why you know, if Elon Musk tweets something, then suddenly you know, the, uh, the, the prices on the market go crazy. But it also means that they're particularly sensitive also to things like uh, you know, open source. And again, a lot of outdated <laughs> uh, attitudes, unfortunately, sadly, drive also the behavior of these markets, thus rewarding uh, companies is that, that hoard that keep things secret, <laughs> you know, and also even ones that are focused around things like defense uh, or intelligence. <clears throat> so the point is resist. Like, you don't have to go in this way. <laughs> uh, 
just because, you know, we are treating most of our cybersecurity startups like factory farm chickens. We are, you know, force feeding them with VC capital so they can grow plump and juicy and attractive looking, right? Over three to five years so we can then liquidate them and, and pull the value out of the company, leaving a dysfunctional carcass left over. Resist, you know, the temptation to do this. I know it sounds really sexy to be a hyper growth startup and to scale, but don't think about scale, think about organic growth because that is what is actually serving your market. <laughs> so, you know, and, and understand also that these, uh, you know, I mean, basically what's happening with these financial institutions that are pretending to be cybersecurity companies, you know, we call them unicorns. Right, you know, and unicorns—they are companies with a one billion U.S. dollar valuation or higher. But in reality, you can take that word "unicorn" and replace it with the word "pension fund subsidized monopoly forming," because that is actually what's happening here. And I say pension fund subsidized because uh, with most VC funds in the United States in particular, 65% of the money going into VC funds come from pension funds. So when you have WeWork that's spending money five times faster than it's getting it from customers, stop and ask the question, whose money are they spending? It's our money that they are spending. And we need to be asking questions about why our anti-competition legislation is not attacking this whole system to begin with. Yeah. And I made uh, a lot of these reflections as being a founder in the cybersecurity market, but this doesn't just apply to cybersecurity. This applies to everything. <laughs> I mean, certainly it applies to uh, generic software, but it also applies to education, to agriculture, to, uh, you know, to, to, to the food system. I mean, to pretty much every you know, industry that you can think of. So resist. <laughs> yeah. And understand that uh, if you are going to uh, do anything for open source, you know, for freedom, for openness, for transparency, also for cybersecurity, open source is a great start. But it's only once you couple it with a compatible, non commercial, financially non-extractive business model, that is the moment when what you're creating is complete. Thank you. Thanks very much, Melanie, for this insightful talk. So uh, undoubtedly, there must be some questions from the audience. Who? Cornelius. Yeah, thank, thanks for the inspiring talk. I think it's uh, really great to see this model of steward ownership uh, being used in this space as well. And uh, what, what I'm wondering is, uh, you mentioned that that uh, the traditional model of selling your company is a, a good way to get rich. Uh, so this is a strong incentive, I think, for a lot of people, also for a lot of organizations. Um, how do you deal with that? That I would assume uh, this steward ownership model and what you described is good for society, but probably not what motivates the majority of people. So thank you for the question. And I get this question a lot, actually. Isn't greed human nature and what do we do about it? <laughs> so um, I think greed is more peer pressure, <laughs> uh, and sometimes a scarcity mindset than really human nature. I mean, there have been all kinds of behavioral psychologists, you know, of, of the Daniel Kahneman type that uh, show that people in general are more intrinsically motivated than extrinsically motivated. I'm sure that most of you here, you're here because you're passionate about open source, so you probably know what I mean. <laughs> so. Uh, so I do think, th the problem though is that uh, we are very much swayed by uh, the society that we live in. And I think there's two factors at play. The first is peer pressure. If your uh, neighbor is going to uh, sell their company and get rich off of it, you're probably going to feel bad uh, you know, if you don't do the same yourself. I can definitely confirm this one. Uh, you know, I read all the same industry uh, trade journals as everyone else, and I realize that you know, here, like XYZ company just got 
bought for, you know, tens of millions. Congratulations to this founder. You know, and then I'll like sit down and I'll think about the choices that I made in my life, right? <laughs> Especially if my staff is being annoying. <laughs> You know, and then I'll go to bed and then I'll wake up the next morning and hope that I'm feeling better. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I, I'm, full, I'm well aware of what I sacrificed. But this is also, I think, part of the reason why it's important to build in the steward ownership from the very beginning. Because at the end of the day, you need to actually put belts and braces on what you're building legally to protect the company from its founder. <laughs> Because we are the largest threat. Because, you know, otherwise, like, you know, 10 years later, we're going to be like, well, actually, maybe selling the company isn't so bad after all. You know, and it's much easier to make this decision before the company is worth something <laughs> as opposed to long afterwards. I mean, now my company is worth enough that, uh, and trust me, I've had awkward conversations even with some folks from Silicon Valley who are like, gee, you know, you were telling me about radically open security and it sounds like such an attractive acquisition target, but then, like, you told me about your business model, so uh, never mind. <laughs> you know, so <laughs> um, it's also part of why uh, the German Purpose Foundation uh, also has in Germany right now an effort towards uh, creating a, a dedicated uh, entity form for steward ownership to actually make it less complex and also cheaper <laughs> uh, to be able to create steward owned companies for founders in the first place. <laughs> So, and the other thing also is it's very much crossing the chasm. You know, it's going to start with the crazy early adopters, the ones who are willing to kind of, the anti-capitalist ones who are willing to go out on a limb to do something a bit different. And then slowly we start building role models and case studies and gradually the narrative stands, starts shifting. And, you know, it goes for a while with the, these different gra gra gradations of uh, early adopters, but then we get to the chasm. And of course, the mainstream is on the other side of the chasm. <laughs> the mainstream is not going to come along because of our ideals. I mean, most of the time, they couldn't care less about our ideals. They're going to come along because what we're building is great. You know, and I've seen this also with uh, Radically Open Security, my own cybersecurity company. You know, at the very beginning, I relied on, you know, techno hippie hacker, you know, <laughs> kinds of people who really, you know, resonated with our ideals. Fortunately, they happened to be CISOs oftentimes, you know, who, who navigated the bureaucracy of their company to get us in the door. Uh, but now, you know, we've got about 150 customers uh, over the history of the company and a lot of them now just come along because we're good. <laughs> you know, and I forgot to mention before, but I mean, we do have a lot of very large customers, everything from Google to the European Commission. We pen tested COVID apps during the pandemic for the European Commission and multiple nation states, uh, including the Google Apple exposure, exposure Notification API for the European Commission. We work with the Dutch Energy Grid, with Wikimedia Foundation. We're part of the Mozilla Open Source Security Program. We work with the Open Tech Fund. <laughs> you know, we've got a lot of very large customers. Customers. And also we do work uh, at cost price on a nonprofit basis for nonprofits, NGOs, and civil society organizations. You know, we have pen tested the Tor project and Tails and Shadow Socks and F Droid and Homebrew and you know a lot of these kinds of things. And I'm really, you know, it's I think only because we're not for profit that they trust us. <laughs> and the irony was, at first, people were like, oh, but if you're not commercial, who's going to trust you? Well, it turns out, actually, they trust us even more because <laughs> we don't have a profit motive. We're not trying to screw anyone over. <laughs> so, uh, you know, so I hope, you know, also that we can inspire you to do the same. But that's really what it's going to be because uh, we have to inspire, you know, and be the leaders that can, can push this forward. And it's, you know, don't worry about the laggards. Don't worry about the skeptics. Don't worry about those people who are never going to separate themselves from profit motive, they're only going to come running from behind afterwards, after we've already made a success from it because they have FOMO. <laughs> so we don't need to worry about them at the beginning. It really starts with just like out the choir members, like I think you guys are the choir, <laughs> you know, and we can be the ones uh, to, to get this change uh, started. So. <laughs>